Okay. Just seeing a few more people coming on board. All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. I am Allison Lester, the Associate Director of Visitor and Member Engagement, and I'm coming to you live from the Heard Museum. I'd like to welcome you to today's virtual art talk in conversation with Kara Romero and Will Wilson. Kara and Will are featured artists in our first ever online only exhibition, Physical Digital Representations of the Body from the Permanent Collection. This exhibition was curated by our fine arts curator, Aaron Joyce, who is also moderating this panel. And it was created as a year end gift to our members and then released to the public in the new year. I'm going to quickly go through a few housekeeping items before we jump into the program. Today's event is a webinar, which means you will only see and hear from me and the panelists. The chat box is open and you are welcome to let us know what you think or post any questions. Just make sure you select everyone if you would like your comments to be seen by more than just me and the panelists. At the very end of the discussion, I will come back on to open the Q&A. At that time, you can submit your questions to either the Q&A function down at the bottom or the comments. I'll be monitoring both. And if you have any technical difficulties, you can call the membership helpline. That number I did uh, drop as the first comment in the chat. We'll also have a brief survey for you at the conclusion of the event. Your responses have been so helpful in helping us plan future programs. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel in about a week. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hear from Karen Will. So with that, I will turn this over to Aaron and I'll see everybody in the Q&A. Thank you, Allison, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna briefly get the PowerPoint up. All right, as Allison said, um, a few of us, her and myself, are coming to you from the Heard Museum. I'd like to acknowledge that the Heard Museum occupies land of the Akama Atham and Holchidam Peeposh peoples, and we'd like to thank them for allowing us to share this space with them. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from Kara Romero and Will Wilson about their photographic practice and sort of the conceptual framework that goes into the work that they do. Um, so to introduce both of them briefly for those of you who are new to them. Kara Romero is a contemporary fine art photographer raised between contrasting settings, the rural Chemehuevi Reservation in Mojave Desert, California, and the urban sprawl of Houston, Texas. Romero's identity informs her photography, a blend of fine art and editorial photography, shaped by years of study and a visceral approach to representing indigenous and non-indigenous cultural memory, collective history and lived experience from a Native American female perspective. As an undergraduate at the University of Houston, Romero pursued a degree in cultural anthropology. Disillusioned by the academic and media portrayals of Native Americans as bygone, Romero realized that photographs could do more than anthropology did in words, a realization that led to a shift in medium. Since 1998, Romero's expanses oeuvre has been informed by the formal training in film, digital, fine art, and commercial photography. By staging theatrical compositions infused with dramatic color, Romero takes on the role of storyteller using contemporary, contemporary photographic techniques to depict the modernity of native peoples, illuminating indigenous worldviews and aspects of supernaturalism in everyday life. Maintaining a studio in Santa Fe, Romero regularly participates in Native American fairs and panel discussions and was featured in PBS's Craft in America in, in 2019. Her award-winning work is included in many public and private collections internationally. Will Wilson's art projects center around the continuation and transformation of customary indigenous cultural practice. He is a Diné photographer and trans customary artist who spent his formative years living on the Navajo Nation. Wilson studied photography, sculpture, and art history at the University of New Mexico, where he earned an MFA in photography in 2002, and Oberlin College, where he earned a studio art and art history BA in 1993. In 2007, Wilson was Wilson won the Native American Fine Art Fellowship at the Idle Drug Museum. In 2010, the Joan Mitchell Foundation Award for Sculpture. And in 2016, the Pollock Krasner Foundation Grant in Photography. And in 2020, Wilson was the Doran Artist in Residence at the Yale University Art Gallery. Wilson has held visiting professorships at the Institute of American Indian Art from 1999 to 2000, Oberlin College from 2000 to 2001, and the University of Arizona to, from 2006 to 2008. 
In 2017, Wilson received the New Mexico Governor's Award for Excellence in the Arts. His work is exhibited and, collect and collected internationally. Wilson's, Wilson is the program head at Santa Fe Community College for Photography. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Will who will give you a little bit of background on his practice. Oh, thank you so much for, for having me, Aaron. And, and thank you so much, Kara, uh, for, for this exciting opportunity to, to talk photo, talk shop um, with you. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly describe a few projects. I'm actually coming to you from um, Fort Worth, Texas, which I think um, was uh, historically uh, Wichita lands, um, indigenous lands here. Um, and the image you're looking at right now on screen is uh, a collaborative project that I'm doing with uh, a friend and uh, a professor of dance here in Fort Worth at, at TCU. Um, named Adam McKinney, uh, and he's developed this amazing project in um, collaboration with an organization that he's the co-director of called DNA Works. Um, and so Adam has done uh, some extensive research and we've collaborated on making images based on a really tragic um, kind of history, uh, traumatic history of, of racialized terror, essentially, the lynching of um, a man named Fred Rouse in 1921 uh, in Fort Worth, Texas. And so in this uh, series of works, Adam is uh, has choreographed and is inhabiting, essentially, Fred Rouse as, as, a, as an individual. Um, and he's done costuming, he's done research. He's standing in front of a building right now that is 1012 North Main, and it was the Ku Klux Clavern, Ku Klux Klan Clavern number 101. Um, and the, the Klan was involved in, in the murder of, of Fred Rouse. And so this was an important kind of site in that, in that history. Um, and so that's another reason I'm here in Fort Worth. Um, but it's a historic photographic process called Wet Plate Collodion that um, I, I, I love and, and it, it talks about history and time and space and um, eventually it will become a talking tintype. So you will be able to download an application, scan this image and see Adam perform one of his choreographed pieces at this location. Um, so Aaron, maybe the next slide please. Um, this work is, is a kind of straying from the photographic, but I, I think it is, I think of it as lens based. Um, it's a reproduction of a uh, customary Diné textile that my grandmother Martha City wove about 40 years ago, uh, rendered in four millimeter glass tiles. Uh, beads, actually. So this was a collaborative project with um, Joy Farley, her sister Pamela Brown, uh, an amazing young filmmaker, Danae filmmaker named Dylan McLaughlin, uh, and our good friend Jamie Smith, who's a community organizer and an educator. Um, and so we added the one component, the QR codes to this design, and, and there's actually a web-based movie um, that, that this textile will link you to that, that talks about the making of the work. Um, so um, a lot of my projects kind of are about like the history of technology and playing with ideas of technology, the past and the present and bringing them together. Because I think, you know, from kind of an indigenous perspective, like time is thought of in a different way. Um, and I also think that, you know, historically native folks have been positioned kind of a historically as kind of existing in this you know, somehow prehistoric past, even though, you know, we're doing amazing stuff today. Um, and, you know, like even the history of computing was based on textile and, and punch cards that automated the process. And I, I think all of these ideas are circulating in some of these, these images. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, so a detail, um, again, to, to, I guess, um, enhance the fact that the design has been shifted uh, to include these, these portals, essentially, to this digitized um, 
kind of storytelling that, that you have to kind of access through, through uh, a device, through scanning. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a, a bit of a shift. Uh, this is a different project. Um, this is something I call uh, connecting the dots for a just transition. And right now it's a photographic, aerial photographic survey of abandoned uranium sites, uh, mines on the Navajo Nation. Um, there's a whole kind of history and legacy of uh, uranium extraction and processing that, that occurred on the nation. Um, you know, from like the time of the development of the first nuclear weapon um, through uh, the arms race and the kind of nuclear um, arms race with, with the Soviet Union. But um, unfortunately, even though, you know, it was well known that the kind of toxic uh, nature of working with these materials, um, the, the Navajo folks who were kind of paid to, to work in these spaces were not warned, were not protected. PPP wasn't something that was available to them or that they, you know, were told that they needed to, to protect themselves with. Um, so, this is actually the site of the rare metals uranium mill, which is four miles from Tuba City, Arizona. And I actually played on the grounds and in the tailings um, as a child of this, this site that's now a super fun site. Um, the mill no longer exists, but um, yeah, it, it, this is ongoing and, and it's a project that I'm particularly kind of excited about. Um, but, and then I think there's one more, one more. Um, example of, of work that I'm I'm currently doing. Um, and I think that's the next slide. Yeah, and so uh, this is um, the shiprock disposal cell, um, which is also part of the Connecting the Dots series. So this is um, remediation that's occurred on the site of um, a uranium mill in Shiprock, New Mexico uh, on the Navajo Nation. And I think one thing that you know is interesting about some of this work, just to think about it kind of in terms of the history of landscape photography and some of these kind of amazing vistas that you find and that exist in, in kind of the annals of, of photographic history. You know, the American West, the shiprock in the distance or Monument Valley, there's one of these huge disposal cells just on the other side of Monument Valley. Um, you know, this history hasn't been told. It hasn't been kind of um, made to represent what the American West is all about. Uh, the other huge issue is water. A lot of these sites are located right near incredibly important water sources for, for the nation. And anybody who knows the, the Southwest knows um, about aridity and how water truly is life here. Um, and then its contamination is, uh, a huge issue, a huge problem. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's those are the images that I saw. Um, is that enough, or should I speak a little bit more about the the practice, Erin? Or um, either way, um, we have a few more images from you. We've got uh, this sort of stitched together tin type, and then we've got a few screenshots of the. Um, of the talking tin types. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly describe what's going on here. Okay. So, so something that I'm also interested in, again, like history of process and history of technology, um, but also like photographic history. Um, you know, there's a period after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1846, 1848, when, you know, the US kind of bought what is the American Southwest. Um, of course, there have been indigenous nations, nations in these sites, you know, since time immemorial. But um, one of the things they did was they set out to photographically survey this new resource, essentially this kind of empty land that, that was there for the taking and for, for you know, exploitation. Um, and so, you know, I'm interested in using the, the technique of the time, which is wet plate, um, wet plate collodion, um, and integrating uh, modern digital photography and kind of continuing um, with 
the narrative of, of this protagonist that's played by myself, who's this post-apocalyptic Navajo man kind of roaming um, this landscape, trying to figure out what's going on and how to, how to survive. Um, and there's a picture of my nice big drone, which I'm particularly kind of fond of. But <laughs> um, and I guess the last slide um, is, is kind of a description of the Talking Tin Type series that, that I've been working on. Uh, I've developed an app with um, Allison Johnson, who teaches at the community college where I teach at. She's a film professor, um, but she's also an app developer. And so a number of the historic tin type um, images that I've taken, and I've actually, I have this beautiful one that I made with Kara, um, of Kara, um, there's actually a, a, an augmented reality component to some of them. And there's a section on my website called Talking Tin Types. Um, but if you download the app, which right now is only available on the um, Apple kind of platform, and you scan um, Senator Enoch, um, he will actually start talking. Kelly uh, Haney, sorry, Enoch Kelly Haney. Um, he will talk about his life as a politician, as an artist, uh, as the man who sculpted the Native American who stands on top of the capital of Oklahoma. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, I'm interested in kind of, again, I guess, giving agency back to the people who are, who are um, represented in, in these still images. Um, which is also kind of a critique or a, a conversation about the history of um, photography of indigenous people. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that that's it. And thanks so much for, for letting me share. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Will. Um, and now we'll hear a little bit from Kara and then we'll have a discussion and opportunity for uh, the viewers to ask a few questions. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I am calling in today from uh, the coastal area of Los Angeles, specifically Hermosa Beach. So the land of the Tongva people, um, the greater nation of Chumash, the Gabrielinos, um, the Serranos and the Ahashmem of the area. And I'm so thankful to be here working um, on sabbatical on a project bringing visibility um, to Native peoples in the greater Los Angeles area. I'm also really thankful to be here. Erin, um, thank you for inviting me to um, be in conversation with Will. Um, he's not only my friend, but somebody that I admire, admire very much and has um, shown incredible generosity to many photographers, many native photographers, and as a teacher and a mentor, Will, your generosity does not go unnoticed. And um, thank you for helping me, especially early on in my own career. Um, today, I wanted to um, talk, I think I have about uh, seven pieces, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the inspiration for each um, and how inspiration for me just really comes from anywhere and everywhere. And I wanted to talk a little bit uh, technically about each of them, um, you know, very quickly how, um, you know, what the lighting diagram was like, how I did these, how much Photoshop I used, and then kind of the life of the photograph, like where it went, where it belongs after that. So I'm going to start with this one that's in the current exhibition. This one is called Coyote Tales number one. Um, the inspiration for the photograph really came um, from a couple of different places. Uh, one, um, I was searching for an Indian car <laughs> for another idea that I had. And um, I was looking for a convertible specifically. And um, my friend, uh, Toby Morphin, as well as Nathaniel, um, thought that they had the perfect car for me. And so they brought me to Española to meet Fred Rael. And it was this beautiful 1964 Impala Lowrider. And I was like, this is not an Indian car. <laughs> but um, it really like set me um, into this uh, stream of consciousness about ways that modern Native Americans actually do fit in within subcultures of American society and all of these like kind of undocumented or 
um, unexamined uh, ways that we we fit in. We're you know fans of heavy metal. We're fans of rap culture. We have skateboarding kids. So really um, looking at ways to visualize uh, you know where we fit in as Native American to these subcultures and low riders. You know myself being from Southern California and many of us being from like Riverside and the Sherman area really do identify with low rider culture. And um, if you're gonna photograph a low rider in Northern New Mexico, you probably wanna do that in front of the Saints and Sinners iconic um, sign. So that was really kind of like all the different sources of imp inspiration for this piece. And as I was um, looking for ways to incorporate content and um, um, really put the rest of the puzzle together for this piece, Coyote came to me, um, you know, as the trickster, the one that appears in um, our fabled stories at times when we're usually going to make bad decisions or mistakes. And so this was really kind of also um, looking at a younger time in my own life when there were still lots of lessons to be learned um, by by and through, vicariously through Coyote um, coming into the picture. And so it was again, uh, another kind of first examination into bringing um, the mythos that we all grew up with, um, reading old stories of mythos and how, you know, to imagine the ways that those um, stories and fables and mythos are still um, very intriguing and still very um, real in our lives and our ways of living and thinking. Um, this was shot right after um, dusk in Española, right in front of the Saints and Sinners bar slash liquor store. Um, <clears throat> we pulled the car up on the sidewalk and I used what's called an inflatable construction light. Um, I rented it from a construction company and um, it kind of is like one of those big lights that inflates. And I was curious to use something like that. I know that they use them in the movies and it really gave this great kind of like moonlight effect. Um, so it was a, a permanent light, not a strobe light. Um, and then uh, the photograph was taken to red in the raw settings of Photoshop and um, the stars were added to the storytelling element of the photograph. Uh, interestingly, I thought I was the only one that thought this photograph was interesting when I did it. I thought it was funny. Sometimes we as artists don't know that things are going to be successful or how they're going to be received um, until they really go out in the world and live. And um, I remember submitting this one specifically for the Swaya show. I think it was in 2017 in August, um, thinking that I... I didn't think it would win anything, but I thought um, all the other natives would enjoy it. And it was something very different. And um, simultaneous to this one, I had entered um, one that was very Southwestern, very um, Pueblo centered. And uh, I got the call that it had won something. And I was sure that it was the black and white one with um, the Coach T content, the Puebloan content. And I came to find out that this one um, actually placed higher than I had ever placed with a photograph at Indian Market. And um, it was my first large edition to sell out. There is um, one in the permanent collection at, at the herd as well as many others. And I think um, those stories are also really interesting. Um, I think when you come from a really vulnerable place, a really um, thoughtful place, um, something that is, you know, very true to yourself, very autobiographical. I think um, sometimes those really resonate with other people that feel the same as you, that can really connect with things on an emotional level. And then these photographs that are kind of like a point in a narrative really um, give the viewer the opportunity to bring their own imagination to the photograph. Um, I think Will was on that judging committee. Was that right, Will? Were you on that? No, maybe it was Jason or Dawes. Um, it was three other photographers that were in that judging committee. Anyways, it meant a huge deal to me um, to take the ribbon on this particular piece because I really wasn't, wasn't too sure about it. Um, but it also ended up in National Geographic, um, which was just beyond my wildest expectations. Um, okay, go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> 
This one is uh, my most recent piece, um, along with one other one um, that I didn't put in this slideshow. This one is called Golga. And Golga is um, an amazing two-spirit um, traditional ecological knowledge regalia maker that just graduated from the Institute of American Indian Arts. He's Yupik um, from a very small territory in rural Alaska. Um, and I'm from a basket making culture. We're all from these cultures that have these incredible indigenous sciences, um, sometimes known as tech or traditional ecological knowledge. Um, I'm really obsessed with traditional ecological knowledge and you know, all of the incredible sophisticated sciences that go into basket weaving, dyeing wool, cleaning hides. Um, a lot of these things really exist against all odds um, when it comes to thinking about um, colonization and ongoing genocide. And I think that they're really undervalued in our whole society as ways of thinking about the health of the ecosystem and health of culture and health of place-based ways. So um, I really wanted to um, celebrate uh, Golga's journey of staying on the pathway of continuing to not only learn the existing traditional ecological knowledge of his peoples, but also um, self-teaching lost arts of um, their particular culture. So he's made everything that he's wearing. Um, and we were also able through the generosity of the Co Foundation um, to borrow uh, the Yupik goggles. Um, they're uh, an, the, an antique set of Yupik snow goggles that Golga had never had the opportunity um, to hold or to wear. So kind of um, bringing that artifact to life in the piece. This was taken during the pandemic. Um, we're both really far away from home um, and it, they let us borrow their 6,000 foot um, warehouse. So it's got kind of that industrial urban feel, which I kind of like that because that's really where we are in place and time um, as natives in Santa Fe. And so we brought in um, a snow machine and a fog machine to kind of create this imaginary space together. Um, he played Yupik music on the set and um, I feel like you can really feel all of that sensory um, um, influence going on in the photograph. Next slide. <clears throat> this one is called Ka, named after um, the uh, young woman in the photograph. Ka Falwell is an incredible um, contemporary um, clay artist from Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, the inspiration for this one um, quite simply came from an article that was written by Rosemary Diaz in First American Art about my husband Diego as a clay artist and she opened the article with an anecdote about um, clay woman and it was the first time that I knew um, that not only um, was clay woman uh, a deity or an entity mythos of the clay that was here in the southwest um, very far away from where I'm from, but that we also um, had the same feminine entity of the clay. And um, the antidote continued that she was uh, soft and warm and inviting and found the world over, but that when you went to fire her, no clay woman or man could ever master her. And I thought that that was also an incredible metaphor for a woman and her body and I had um, already embarked on an exploration of bringing back the figurative with Native American women, the nude, if you will, um, from a very maternal, very matriarchal perspective as a female photographer to counter um, the lowbrow um, work that was out there of our women that I feel contributes to um, the exploitation and epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. So my work in the figurative comes from a place of empowerment, of um, maternal worldview and a celebration of our bodies. She is painted in clay from my reservation. She has a second photograph of a Mesa Verde vessel um, overlaid in a layer in Photoshop called an overlay, very, gently um, laid onto her skin and her hair is captured at one eight thousandth of a second, which means we use every single light in the studio. <laughs> okay, next slide. 
<clears throat> this one is Naomi and it's from a series called First American Girls. And this was conceived of um, by looking at my husband's um, collection of GI Joes. Um, they are all um, still in the box and he comes from a lineage of doll and toy collectors. And they're really fascinating, the entire collection. The GI Joes specifically um, are all completely historically accurate um, with great love and detail and the type of camouflage they wear, the wars that they're from. So all of their cultural accoutrement, right? And um, simultaneously, when I started making this series in 2015, our daughter was 11 years old and we really wanted to pass on this lineage of doll collecting to her to find out very quickly the paucity of culturally accurate dolls um, for Native American girls and women. And what was available was usually um, Pan Indian or Plains Indian or really disappointing you know, versions at the truck stop with bad pony beads and buckskin. So just like disappointment wherever you looked. And so I thought um, I would create um, this series of dolls that celebrated um, the diversity of our tribes, of our incredible high fashion regalia. So that's the use of the high fashion lighting. And um, they became these incredibly collaborative pieces often with the moms and the daughters. So they show a great amount of intergener intergenerational love and indigenous science poured into each one. And then this use of color. Um, this use of really bright color that screams psychologically that these are modern women, um, that these are living women with every detail to the graphic design. So we actually built a life-size doll box. This one was papered with the black and white um, checkered wallpaper, um, both on the floor as well as the outer edge of the doll box. And there's others in the series that um, each loving detail, like those GI Joes, is incredibly, um, thought, you know, well thought out and um, speaks to the person that's being represented in the kind of diorama there. I could go on for a while, but I think you get it. And the next one is a detail shot. So these stand about 60 inches tall, and they really give you a chance to, um, you know, counter that idea of buckskin and pony beads and everything wrong. Um, to really uh, celebrate, you know, the years of work and indigenous science and collection of precious items and objects that go into making, you know, hundreds of abalone adornments and, you know, belts that take a year to loom and, you know, thousands of pine nuts that have been cleaned by hand and clamshells that have been, you know, each one um, seen the lapidary. Uh, machine. Okay, next slide. This one is called Puha, and this is a celebration of the bird singers found in Southern California. Um, this, uh, these are the four boys that I've been working with from my reservation. So two sets of brothers, um, just beautiful young boys that um, create this, you know, whenever they show up, they're kind of also like bring this um, graphic of repeated pattern because they all look so similar. Um, and so they just all together like kind of um, uh, exponentially grow the power of the photograph and the graphic um, by being all together. And then their, their candor with each other is so beautiful um, that they are very playful and it's all very natural and very fun to work with them. Um, this was taken uh, on a hilltop at sunset, so it is just quite um, a lovely silhouette of the four boys, very painstakingly, put your foot there, move this way, I need your profile, you know, so um, we've gotten used to working with each other for the last couple of years, and I just enjoy it so much. Next slide. How am I doing on time? Am I doing okay? Okay, I think I have um, two more slides. This one is called TV Indians. Um, this one I just recently released in color. Um, a lot of people have probably seen it in sepia tone. If I had to describe it in one um, sentence, I often say it's a postmodern response to Curtis when it was appearing, especially in the sepia tone. 
Um, I always loved it in color. And so I had the opportunity to show it at the New Mexico Museum of Art very recently. And I took that opportunity to show it um, in color. I shoot digitally, um, always in raw and color in a very large format, high resolution Canon camera. Um, and so then uh, color is always the very last thing um, that I work with uh, in the photograph, making sure that um, as much as I can possibly do in camera is done in camera. And that comes from like Will starting out in film, like that's that's how we did it <laughs> in film. Everything was done in camera and um, there's really no substitute for proper exposure and, you know, use of lighting and, you know, understanding how to, you know, dial down your f-stop or your shutter speed um, to be able to capture the clouds and, you know, the proper exposure on the models. Um, this one is really very simply, um, it, it began, you know, looking at the ruins and the New Mexico landscape and these adobe bricks that were piled up in different places and, you know, in some kind of very surreal daydream type of way, um, looking at our consumerism and our TVs and, and wanting to place those in the landscape and placing the images of how we are portrayed in the media um, became another way to layer content into the photograph. So you'll see on all of the TVs um, that were turned on with a generator on set. So some of them you'll see have like snow or static on them. That's because they really were turned on. And then all of the images that appear on the TVs of like Iron Eyes Cody and Billy Jack and Smoke Signals and Little Big Man are um, lovingly placed in there with photo illustration or the use of Photoshop. Um, these are kind of nuanced selections. So like while they're very stereotypical, they're also kind of somewhat beloved. Um, imagery of Native Americans and Hollywood. And I think some of that is because that's all we had um, growing up. And so there's some kind of, of, of beloved nuanced sense. And then some kind of like, when you look at them all together, somewhat ridiculousness to um, what these portrayals look like compared to what the human beings that are placed in like this parallel existence in front of them. And so there's really, you can really spend time with this photograph and, and um, see lots of stuff. And the final one is water memory. Um, the subject for this was really um, inspired by um, climate change. Um, when I was in uh, Vancouver and visiting my friends in Canada, um, I began to hear stories of how their, uh, their ice bridges, their land bridges were melting. And I began to um, you know, do a lot of reading. This was in 2014, 2015, when the concept for this was being conceived um, and the great flood that was coming, You know what it looks like when 10 meters of water rises. And I began to simultaneously think about historic flooding and how many of our tribes were flooded out of our ancestral valleys. Um, in the name of hydroelectric energy and damming up our waterways and flooding our old ways of life. And then there was more than there was present day flooding of, you know, how people were already being affected by climate change and the Las Conchas fires and villages were flooding in ways that um, we had not seen before that. So there's um, three in the series. Uh, and they are all free falling um, in a mysterious deluge of water, which brings um, all of that to your attention about the climate change and the flooding for hydroelectric energy. But they also give the viewer a sense of um, peace and blessing and life cycle and going back to mother earth. And so there's just, um, I think people are really able to view these um, in any way uh, that they want to. They're just really magical. Um, in real life, they were photographed in tandem scuba diving um, with a local uh, scuba diving instructor in Santa Fe. They were taken at the bottom of the swimming pool at the El Rey Inn, which is a local hotel. Um, and they are photo composites in the sense, I used a fisheye lens, lens, did I say that? Fisheye lens. 
um, to give that incredible foreshortening of like the evergreen at the front of the camera. And then um, the photograph of Santiago in the back uh, was taken just him by himself and leaving the whole tank of water. And then the photograph of Rosie placed in the front, she's actually in the shallow end. And then all of the pool elements are photoshopped out and each one kind of taken to a different color. I chose people and friends and family that had all either been historically or presently or in the near future um, affected by flooding or climate change. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Kara, and thank you so much, Will. I think it's given our audience a lot of really beautiful insight, not only into your work, but also into um, sort of the process that goes into the works themselves. Um, and one thing that I think is a through line through both of your practices, and it's something that you said, Kara, um, was that uh, specifically the television piece um, in the in that sort of open plane, you said it's a postmodern response to Curtis, and um, you mentioned that as well, Will. That a lot of your work, especially the the talking tin types, they sort of fight against that um, that sort of constructed or reductive uh, representation of indigenous peoples that was done through a dominant culture lens, and you're sort of reclaiming that agency. Um, I'm wondering if you could share some some sort of feedback or insights you've gotten from maybe even just the models or the collaborators that you've worked with on, on what that process has been like for them and how they've, how they've felt afterward in terms of feeling empowered or feeling um, seen uh, by a larger audience. Do you wanna go first, Will? Okay, sure. Um, I'll just cite one project that I did with, um in collaboration with Heather Ottone, who's um, an amazing Choctaw Chickasaw curator, um, who's working on the first American museum now that's gonna open its doors very soon in Oklahoma City. Um, but she was then the curator of Native American and um, basically her task was to do the rest of the world, <laughs> except for kind of like white history. Um, but she, um, reached out to me and knew that I was doing the CIPICS project and she wanted to revisit the Curtis photographs of Oklahoma specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and so she thought, we, 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 we talked a lot about like what, you know, what it meant. One of the taglines for that project is what if Indians invented photography? Um, you know, would there be like a different set of like <laughs> protocols or just like respect <laughs> and honor and reciprocity associated with the practice? <clears throat> And, um, you know, she, she had a chip on her shoulder about Curtis and about what he wrote about Oklahoma in particular, because when he got there, you know, he, he didn't find what he wanted to find. He said they were all assimilated, you know, um, and just through a couple of years of engagement with community and, and getting their buy-in, we, we, we got to go to these different places and sites that Curtis had visited. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, I think, transform the dynamic of the way that those images functioned. And, and eventually, there was a big show at the um, Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art on the campus of the University of Oklahoma. And it became, you know, I mean, in our eyes, an indigenous space. Like, we reclaimed that space for, like, Native Americans or indigenous people of Oklahoma. Um, and rightly so, right? Um, and there were like 500 people from all of these communities like coming together and, and you know, they were honored and, and um, you know, it was just, a, I think, a, an amazing thing to be part of uh, and to help facilitate, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Karen? Um, I'll start with my relationship to Curtis. Um, I came to IAI, the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe in 1999. And I just had a little bit of um, photography under my belt when I showed up. And um, so I was really open um, to influence. And I think as a young artist, I started with what was available um, as, you know, like what was known at the time as Native American photography. And that really was Curtis. I mean, we all grew up with these incredible 
incredibly beautiful images that were technically expert um, that we all kind of held not maybe not everybody but a lot of us held as like precious glimpses into the past of people that we descend from um, people that aren't with us anymore um, and so I really started there. I remember, you know, my first photographs were black and white silver gelatins asking my friends and family, will you put on your regalia and go, you know, stand in a field with no, you know, nothing modern, you know, there in the landscape, you know, and I think that that, you know, I left school and I was kind of like disillusioned. Um, I didn't know if I was boring or if my ideas were boring, but I think it took a little maturity to be like, we don't even do that. <laughs> like, we, <laughs> like we don't do that, you know? And so, um, you know, it was much later where I, you know, started making work that was like more honest to my autobiography, which, you know, is not the same as everybody. Like we're so diverse as native people, like thousands mm -hmm. of stories you know, hundreds of tribes. Um, so I feel like as many stories as we can possibly tell at this point, we're kind of like countering that one story narrative, which is like what Curtis kind of did when he captured mm -hmm. the imagination of the globe, right? It's like, okay, so now everybody thinks like that's what Native Americans look like and they dress like. And if you're not that, you're not a real Indian, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, we know that that's not true. Um, for me, I think the second part of the question is about the exploitive nature of photography. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, again, when I was younger, I think I set out to do this and I was like, I really want to be a National Geographic photographer. This is, you know, 21 year old Kara. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, 22 year old Kara is in, you know, native studies and you realize like, oh man, that's like the most exploitive, you know, like <laughs> periodical, like exist when it comes to you know taking pictures of indigenous peoples around the globe and not really giving back right mm -hmm. and so there was another like existential crisis as a native photographer of what am I doing you know like how do I do this and indigenize this medium like how do I reinvent this so that it's of service to my community that I'm not taking um, so all of those are like ever present for me. Like, how am I giving back to my community? Does, is this telling a true story about the person that I'm taking a picture of? Um, have we talked about the subject matter? Do they have free prior and informed consent? Is there, you know, biography coming through in the photograph? Um, so there's a lot of interview. There's a lot of collaboration with the person um, that we're working with. Um, and then I even like let them see it before it's ever released out into the world, like before it ever like makes it to social media or anything like, do you like the way that you're represented here? Mm -hmm. um, and usually, you know, the answer's usually been yes. And I think just building that process of trust has, you know, been um, like successful for me. And I knew like at some point it was successful, uh, you know, I, women often take center stage. I think that's because I am a woman and you kind of photograph what you know, but like when people are like, will you photograph my daughter? Like that's like the ultimate, like, yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, like that's like trust from, you know, native aunties and women of like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. yes. Like, let me, and so I'll just end with this. I think Will can probably relate to this also like crossing the digital divide you know, the incredible expense of photography as a medium is probably the number one reason why kids from community of color don't get to tell their own stories. Like it's so expensive. There were so many times where I was like, this is a frivolous expense. I should not be spending money on this. You know, there's so many more like, you know, ways of survival that I should probably be spending my money on. And it really took like a mental shift of being like, no, this is an act of self-care. And as I pushed through that mentality of the expense of photography, photography became this incredible a privilege that is not afforded to our community. Mm -hmm. And so now I really feel like I can be of service, you know, like I can create this incredibly highly produced, really expensive sets or, you know, that have the visual effect of really expensive, highly, they're not always <laughs> expensively <laughs> produced because we learn how to be really resourceful when you come from, you know, a different background. Um, but it's become this incredible privilege to be able to make photographs that um, can sit with um, photographers from other cultures and then 
you know, it's like this privilege of representation. And that makes me very thankful that I stuck with it. Um, okay, I'll stop. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> well, and I think, um, you know, to your point earlier about the, the sort of pan indigeneity that that Curtis perpetuated, um, that media uh, through Hollywood or, or, you know, just sort of popular culture, dominant culture um, sort of constructs and perpetuates about indigenous people. I think both of your practices is really trying to look at the, the dynamism and the, the just sheer number of different cultures that are existent in indigenous North America, you know, from even the way with your first American doll series, you know, there are several in that series that um, illuminate different cultures and different people from those cultures. And with the talking tin types that they're about these, they're about individuals and stories and not just this pan reductive reading um, that feels very, you know, extractive, you know, um, you know, and you also, both of your work deals a lot with um, sort of climate crisis and climate change and um, the sort of environmental racism that has exacerbated that and disproportionately affected indigenous communities over, over non-indigenous and specifically white communities. Um, you know, so I think that there's this, um, this binary of both cultural extraction that's happened and, and sort of energy extraction and environmental abuses that's happened. And I think the work that both of you are doing really helps create visibility for people who are so unaware or uninformed about these communities and these cultures. And um, the, you know, one other thing that really is so interesting is the, the idea of technology. And I think people often, especially because we live in the digital age, we think of technology as our cell phones or our computers or, or televisions and, and all these fancy gadgets that that we use um, on a daily basis but you know when you really think about the technologies that um, have existed in indigenous communities for centuries you know like you said the the technology of weaving and this idea of computing um, or the technology of basketry um, or just the technology of like ecological knowledge ways and even the technology of storytelling and passing down that information generationally is so important Well, I guess at this point, if we have any um, questions, I think Allison has a few from our, our viewers out there in TV land. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I think you both touched on a few of the questions. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask is how many projects do you typically work on at any one time? And how with that, if you do work on multiple projects, how do you prioritize um, the different inspirations that you may have for those projects? Well, if you want to go first, if you have. <laughs> um, I think I'm a little bit ADD, and uh, <laughs> I think that I've found my comfort zone in, in trying to juggle multiple things. Um, uh, I do work on multiple projects. You know, um, I that's a, that's a hard question for me to ans answer. I mean, I, I think it's an incredible privilege to be able to actually make a living uh, doing what what I do as a creative person, you know. And um, I think part of like coming from a a very kind of like working class, poor, like dirt poor res background, like any opportunity that comes my way, I'm like, okay, I can take that on. Okay, I need to take that on. Like, I can't let that one go, you know, um, which, which is which is problematic at times. Um, and I think it's a skill to, to prioritize and, and to really be able to invest and, and do a good job. So balancing is something that I think I'm still trying to figure out. I was um, talking to Aaron before we um, went live about being a mom. And um, really, you know, when I started out, I walked around with my camera and I found a lot of photographs and there was like an entirely different process. And then becoming a parent um, really changed for me. Um, most of my ideas come from my imagination first. So washing the dishes, doing the clothes, helping with the homework, you know, being somewhere else in my mind <laughs> is I'm in my photographs and I'll run to my sketchbook. And, you know, oftentimes um, 
worthy ideas or ideas that I feel like are important to pursue will come back for me. They'll be like starting to haunt me and I'll have more ideas and, you know, visuals will start to come up. Um, that being said, I, I have tried to um, kind of balance like creating cohesive bodies of work with my way my brain works, which is, you know, I'm also kind of ADD also. And I found it's more important for me to kind of strike why the inspiration is there and trust your intuition about like, if this idea is really present for you um, and you're starting to produce it and there's like some synchronicity happening, like the person is available, they're really into it. The TVs appeared out of nowhere. The scuba diving instructor called you back. Like that for me is kind of like, okay, I'm gonna go this way. And this feels like this art wants to happen. And that's something that I keep like with me all the way to the set is a lot of times I'll have multiple ideas, but it feels like something specifically wants to happen. So like holding space for the art, holding space for the process and having many ideas, but not getting, usually my failures happen when I'm like so attached to this like one thing that I forget to see or that I forget to be open to inspiration. And so I think as artists, we're always trying to like, like have these ideas and follow them, but also leave room for the art that wants to happen. Um, I hope that answered the question somewhat. <laughs> no, I think it, it is great um, to kind of hear that, to know how you kind of approach that and then how it translates into the composition of your work too. Um, a real quick question somebody just asked about, uh, Kara, your flood photo, was that shown at uh, Smoka? I think so. Yep. Uh, quite a while ago. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to get that answered before doing a quick little Google search. And then um, I think I've got one more question. It's kind of a fun one. We'll kind of end on something fun. What, um, when people ask what you do for a living, how do you describe your job? I just <laughs> say I'm an artist and an educator. I say I'm a contemporary fine art photographer. Great. I think that's it for questions today. It's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you again. And um, I'm going to go ahead. If anyone has not had a chance to look at the uh, exhibition to do that, I'm going to put that in the comments. So uh, you can go check that out right after we conclude this uh, session. And please know that uh, a lot of our 3D objects are set up on turntables, so they do move. So just give it a minute, go to the website. And if you do see the 3D object, just give it a second and see if it'll move. They're really great. And then with Kara and Will's work, you can um, click on them and read more and learn more about them as well. So thank you again, both. And thank you, Aaron, for moderating a wonderful discussion. Well, thank you both so much for joining us and thanks everyone for watching. I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Me too. Take care.